And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the matter of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bury it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew it knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And said unto him, Every man at the beginning doeth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. As we look at this passage of scripture, I'd like for us to basically look at one phrase. Where, verse 5, where, where, the, the, where the, the mother of Jesus said to his servants, said to the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's the best advice that anybody could ever give anybody. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And you'll say, well, preacher, what if I can't? Be like the man with the withered hand when Jesus said, stretch it out. If he says, do it, just stretch it out. Just do it anyway. Makes no difference how impossible it may look. It ought to be the governing motto of our life. Whatsoever he says to me, I'm going to do it. If it's the choice of a career, it ought to be what Jesus says. If it's love, courtship, and wedlock, it ought to be what Jesus said. Makes no difference how ugly she is. If it's daily Christian life, it ought to be what Jesus says. I mean, whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. And I got news for you, it'll turn out all right. May not look like it, may not feel like it, you may not think it will, but it will. If Jesus said it, it'll work, folk. I guarantee you. I've had folk give me a lot of advice that didn't work. But Jesus has never given me any that didn't work. Thank God for it. Everything he says works. We notice three features of this motherly advice, and I'm going to give you a little outline, and I'm going to preach. First of all, we notice the entirety of the obedience. Notice what she said. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Our obedience is to be entire, complete. You know, a lot of times we want partial obedience. If we agree with it, we'll do it. If we don't agree with it, we won't do it. Or we'll do part of it. And feel like, well, you know, God ought to be excited about the fact that we have done part of what he said do. But no, he said, whatsoever he saith, do it. Now, a lot of you are half there. A lot of times I'm half there. Part of what he said. But Mary said to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. And the next thing, it was to be exclusive. What he says. Not what others say, not what others think. I've had people through the years come to give me all kind of advice in the world. And I I say to them, you know, if you're going to change churches every two years, you can take a lot of advice, try it. If it don't work, move on somewhere else. But if you're thinking on staying, I've been here 40 years, then you got to be careful. Because if it don't work, you got to stay long enough to straighten it out. Right or wrong. And you know, if folks give that advice, they move on. But you've got to be there and live with the advice that you follow. So we ought to exclusively know what Christ is saying to our heart and what the plan of God is for our life and the purpose of God is for our life. And if it dissatisfies everybody else, what difference does it make if it pleases Jesus? And if it pleases Jesus, what difference does it make if it dissatisfies everybody else? All right. So, uh, it's whatsoever he said. And then, specific. Do, not just something. Not something like what he said. Not something equivalent to what he said. But do exactly what he says to do. Boy, that's a big difference, isn't it? You know, a lot of times God speaks to my heart and say do this and I, I say God you know this would do just as well you ever do that I mean this would simplify the thing 
What you're talking about is a complicated thing. Let's just do it this way. No, but he says, whatsoever he saith unto you. Not something like it, not something that you'd rather do, not something that'd be equivalent to it, but whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Then another thing about it was this. There's three features in the obedience of those servants of Christ. In verse 7, it says that they obeyed immediately. And you know, uh, that's always a key thing when God speaks to us. You know what I found out? When God speaks to me and I know that I've heard from God, if I immediately do it, it's a whole lot easier to do it than if I wait. You know why? Because human reasoning will get in. People's opinion will get in. You'll begin to look at the difficulties and the circumstances. You'll begin to wonder about what if it doesn't work. But if I just do it, I'll tell you, I've got it done before the devil has opportunity to make, su- to make suggestions. And that's so in all of our lives. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. You know, God's been saying some things to us in this count meeting. A lot of folks say, well, when I get home, I'm going to do it. No, you'll change your mind before you ever get home. You're getting a fight on the way home, but you forgot about it. That's why we need to immediately obey God. What would happen in every service when God spoke if we'd obey? You know, like Brother Danny preached yesterday morning, Brother Malcolm, Brother Sonny preached last night. What if while they were preaching and God spoke to our heart, if we would have just instantly obeyed God, just got up and come to the altar and obeyed God? Wouldn't it disturb the preacher? In fact, it would have probably fired him up. Immediately obey God. You know, there's been times God spoke to me about giving. And boy, I was all fired up, ready to do it. But I didn't do it. And then I'd get home and look at my bills. And I'd get home and think about what I'd like to do here and like to do there and what I wanted, what my wife wanted. And uh, first thing you know, I'd be talking myself out of it. Where if I'd have just obeyed God, I could have been blessed of God and shouted over it. It needs to be done immediately. And then... They obeyed completely everything that Jesus said do. And then we notice how how successive it was. He said, first of all, to fail. They failed. Now that's about as far as a lot of folk ever get. But then he had another word. It was to draw. And then he had another word to bear. And there was complete successive obedience. To fail, to draw, and to bear. Now, if they'd have just filled the water pots and have never drawn, it wouldn't have done anybody any good. And if they'd have just drawn it and hadn't have served it, it wouldn't have done anybody any good. But it was absolute, successive, complete obedience. And most time when Christ calls on us to do something, it's just not one thing. It's a successive thing we're in that we begin. And I'll tell you, we have to successively obey God until we have completely done what God says do. Right or wrong. All right. Now, there were three main features of the outcome when you obey God and when they obeyed God, and always will be. Now, we all want this to happen, but we don't want it to be complete, immediate obedience in order to see God do it the way he did. And we noticed this. There was a supernatural intervention when they obeyed God. The water was turned into wine. Ladies and gentlemen, We all want a supernatural intervention of God in the services of God and in our life. It'll never happen until there's obedience to God. And whenever we have obeyed God, we can expect a divine supernatural intervention. We can expect something to happen from above. And that's what we need, folk, in this service and every service is something from above for a divine manifestation of holy God. There was a divine intervention. And then there was a wonderful transformation. The social catastrophe was given a happy ending. There was humiliation. There was embarrassment. For the governor, the feast, and the bridegroom. But whenever there was a divine intervention, there was a wonderful transformation. And when God shows up, he'll transform things, folk. He'll transform people. We can't change people. Glory to God, he can. 
I'll never forget the first church I pastored, 19 years old. And I went in that church, I was going to change everybody in it. First 30 days, that was my goal. <laughs> Some of them been in the church 50 and 60 years. And it wasn't long until I realized I couldn't change anybody. Yeah. That if anybody was changed, it was going to take a divine intervention of God. And if God would come down supernaturally in that church, then in that divine intervention, he would gloriously transform people into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. So really, instead of us trying to change people, what we need to do is obey God, get right with God, and expect God to intervene and do something. And we notice something else. There was a significant revelation. Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. When there's a divine intervention and a wonderful transformation, Jesus is always going to be glorified in it, folks. And that's what he wants to do is to glorify himself. There could be such divine interventions and transformations and revelations and happy endings again and again and again in our life if we had learned to just do what he says do and fully and completely obey God. In fact, it ought to be our lifestyle. It ought to be the testimony of our life day by day that God intervened. God transformed things. God give us a happy ending to that which looked so miserable. And I'll tell you, that which looked so embarrassing. When God got through and changed things, it was a happy ending. And God glorified it, himself in it. Thank God for it. Now, we notice something else where this miracle took place in a humble home in Galilee. And folk, I'm going to tell you something. What don't work at home is not real. Right or wrong. We need to get God in our homes. And that's where this miracle took place. It brought God right into the home circle where the wedding was taking place. In the ordinary things of life, you know, most of us, whenever we think about God doing something, we're thinking about a big, a big mountaintop experience. But God wants to get in our everyday life. That's where we need him, folk. Is in our everyday living. Somebody said, well, the rubber hits the road. That's when we need God. Well, we can shout on other folks' faith in a camp meeting and other folk experience. But we need him in our ordinary life. Out there in the home where there's problems and troubles and burdens and bills to be paid. Maybe lost a job and need a job and the children going astray and the grandchildren all backslidden. That's where we need God. In the, in the home, in the ordinary affairs of life. And that's where God wants to meet with us. This miracle happened. To save a humble Galilean family from hurt and from embarrassment. It was in sympathy and kindness and understanding for simple folk. Jesus demonstrated his power. Glory be to God for it. A couple of things about Mary. She instinctively turned to Jesus when something went wrong. Boy, not a good thing to do. Hallelujah. Something go wrong, turn to Jesus. Even when she didn't know what he would do, and it seemed that he had refused her request, she trusted that he would do the right thing. Go to God, he always will. He'll do the right thing. We have to trust when we don't understand. But we can. We can trust him. Now, the message for the day. We see the disciples, or the servants, as they did what Jesus commanded them to do. They did all that they could do. They filled the water pots, they drew, and they served. That was all that they could do, but they did all that they could do. 
And when they had done all that they could do, Jesus did what it was impossible for them to do. He turned the water into wine. And I'm going to take about three Bible illustrations, and I'm going to convince you that that's the way God always works. So often we say, oh, God, do something. God, do something. I'll tell you, whenever we have obeyed God completely and done what we can do, I'll tell you without fail, God will do what we can't do. But don't ask God to do anything unless we have obeyed. Don't expect God to do anything unless we have done what we know that we ought to do. If God's calling us to repent, let's repent. If God's calling us to evangelism, evangelize. If God's calling us to give, give. And I'll tell you what will happen. Once we have done what God said do, all he said do, do it successively, immediately, then we can expect the divine intervention from God and God will do what it was impossible for us to do. But we want God to do the impossible before we do anything. Is that right or wrong? I mean, we said, oh, God, we want a miracle. Why don't we do what we know to do? Come to the end of ourselves and then cast ourselves up on the Lord Jesus and said, God, this is all we can do. You've got to do the rest of it. And he'll do it. All right. In the book of Kings, there was a drought. There was no water. The land was dry. The prophet of God said to them, Verse 17, for thus saith the Lord, God speaking through the prophet, and he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, and yet shall the valley be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beast. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord, but he will deliver the Moabites into your hands. And then what does the scripture say? In the morning... When they arose, there was water. Now let me ask you a question. How many ditches did God fill? All they dug. Now, the principle. God did not dig the ditches. That was something that they could do. They could dig the ditches. God never handled a shovel. He enabled them to do it. But, but he called on them to do what they could do. You know why? There's always got to be corresponding works with our faith. There's no such thing as faith without corresponding works. And so, if they was to believe what the prophet said, that God was going to fill the valley with water, and fill the ditches they dug, then there had to be corresponding works, evidence of the fact that they were believing God, and they went out and dug the valley full of ditches, and God filled every ditch they dug. And I'm telling you something, folk. If we dig our ditches in faith, there'd be no empty ditches. If we dig them in obedience to what God said, believing God will keep his word, they just didn't decide to go out and dig some ditches. God said dig them. It was an obedience to God. And when they dug them, I'll tell you, they dug them in faith. Corresponding works. And God filled every ditch that they dug. When they'd done all that they could do, they couldn't do anything else but dig the ditches. And when they got through doing all that they could do, the valley was just as dry as it ever was. Right or wrong. But then when God honored what they did and honored their obedience, he did what they could not do. He supernaturally filled the ditches. There was a divine intervention and a wonderful transformation. That's the way it goes, folk. We want the divine intervention. We want the wonderful transformation. We want the supernatural. We want the miracles. But we won't just sit back and say, oh, God, do it. Oh, God, do it. I'll tell you what, folk. God works according to our corresponding works and our faith. And I'll tell you, in our obedience, whenever we have obeyed God and our works has lined up with the commands of God and we have done what God said do, we have every right in the world to expect the divine intervention. 
All right? You don't believe it yet, I'm going to give you another illustration. In the fourth chapter of the book of Kings, there was a little widow. Her husband had died. She couldn't pay her bills, and they appealed to the prophet of God. He said to her, under the, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the inspiration of God, he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. She said, I got one pot of oil. Jesus, and, and the prophet said, go out and borrow some, borrow some empty vessels, borrow out a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, that, that, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the empty vessels, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me yet another vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and they all stayed. How many vessels did God fill? All she set out. There wasn't an empty, the scripture said, glory to God, there wasn't an empty vessel. Now, notice what it was again, same principle. Just where I can preach the same message five times. <laughs> and then maybe we'll get a little of it. Here was a woman, she was without. Terrible, destitute condition, heartbroken, lost her husband. Now her son was going to be taken. She needed the bills to be paid. She went to the man of God. Thank God she went to the right person. And he said, tell you, what do you have? She said, nothing but one pot of oil. He said, that's all you need. If that's all committed to Jesus, and you'll obey you'll see a divine intervention. He said, go out and borrow oil pots. They went out and borrowed oil pots, brought them in, and began to pour up the oil. I imagine they poured the first, looked in, the one that poured out of, just as full as what it was whenever they started. Poured the next one, it was just as full. Poured the next one, it was just as Boy, don't you know that was exciting? By obeying God, wasn't that some exciting? She poured the next one. It was full, and the oil pot was still full. And then, I don't know how many it was. But I know one thing. She filled every one that they brought in. And there's still plenty more. Hallelujah. Now, same principle. God didn't gather up the oil pots. That was something they could do. They could carry in the oil pots. But whenever they had obeyed, see, there was corresponding works to their faith. She believed the man of God. And as a result that she believed the man of God, there was corresponding works that gathered up the oil pots. And when they gathered up the oil pots and began to pour in the oil, then there was a divine intervention because there was complete obedience and all the oil pots was filled. Then there, I'll tell you, things changed in that home when they obeyed Jesus. They sold the oil. She paid, I'll tell you, the debt off to free her sons and had some left over. Glory be to God for it. She did what they could do. They, they did what they could do. When they did all that they could do and everything God said do, then God did what they couldn't do. He performed a miracle. It was a supernatural work of God according to their obedience and according to their faith. You know, we're deciding what God's going to do for us, folk. Because I believe God wants to fill the ditches with water. He said, I'll give drink to him that's thirsty and pour floods upon the dry ground. God wants to bless us. Someone said he'd rather bless us, I'll tell you, because of obedience than he had curses because of disobedience. One more illustration. Go with me to the grave of Lazarus. When Jesus stood at that grave, what happened? They said, Jesus said, roll away the stone. They said, by this time, he stinketh. No use now, God. You're too late. 
Jesus had already said, if thou canst believe, you'll see the glory of God. That's always so. I'll tell you, if we believe, if we live the faith life, we can live constantly seeing God's glory, God's glory, divine intervention, divine transformation. I'll tell you, it ought to be the ordinary thing of life. And so Jesus said to them, roll away the stone. Jesus didn't touch that stone. He could have spoke to it and it would have rolled away. He could have done whatever he wanted to to pay off that woman's debt. He could have just let the folk got up the next morning and the ditch has been dug and the valley been filled with water, but that's not the way God works. That's the way a lot of folk act like they think he's going to work. That's why a lot of folk don't ever get much done at church. Always saying God do something, but we don't ever have corresponding works. Give you a little illustration before I get back on this. I don't want to run too many rabbits, but I will chase one now and then. <laughs> I had a preacher friend once that had a church in a big Christian school. And uh, he was about to lose it. The bank was going to take it. They had done postponed the note, postponed the note, and finally came to him, called him in and said, Pastor, we don't want to do this. It's not going to be a good thing in the community and so forth, but we have a responsibility. We're going to have to foreclose on this property. Well, he said he got to reading the Word of God over uh, in the book of Chronicles where that uh, Jehoshaphat said, that neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And he read that and he said, now I know we can do one thing. We can do all we can do. And once we've done that, if God doesn't do something, we'll at least know that we've done all that we can do. He said that most churches were having fundraising banquets. He said they didn't have any money for that. They had to have potluck supper. He said they had a potluck supper. He said he got up. He read the letter from the bank. said we're going to lose these properties and these buildings. But he said we're going to do one thing. We're going to do all we can do before we do it. We're going to know that we've done all that we can do. And he said then, you know, it just may be God do something. But that we've done what we can do, why pray God do something? And they owed about $20,000, and that was back in the old days. Back in Brother Sonny's days. <laughs> and he said they talked, fellowshiped a little, and said, now we're going to take an offering. Do what we can do. All we want you to do is what you can do. If whatever you can do, you do it. But we get through, we want to be able to stand before God and say, God, we've done all that we know to do. He said they took that offering. He said he was looking maybe two or three thousand dollars. And he said they counted it. They had more than enough money to pay off the note at the bank. They paid off all the bills in the church, caught up on his salary, and had money left in the bank. Now you know what they'd been doing? They'd been praying for months. Oh, God, do something. Oh, God, do something. God said, I'm waiting on you. <laughs> right or wrong? God said, I'm waiting on you to do something. Do all you know to do. Do all you can do. And then I'll perform a miracle and do the rest. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe that was a miracle offering and God was in it. And I believe there's folk in that church that gave by faith. Yeah. Gave out their poverty. But yet I say that to say this. So often we are praying about things that we ought to have already done and asking God to do it. And if we do all that we know to do, all that we can do, and we have corresponding works through our faith and what we believe that God's going to do, I believe we can have divine interventions consistently in our life. Now at the grave of Lazarus, Jesus said, roll away the stone. He didn't touch that stone. But I'll tell you what he did do. When he had obeyed, he did what they could not do. No man in that cemetery could have raised Lazarus. But Jesus just stood at the grave of that tomb of that, at the front of that grave and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up. Now, when they had done what they could do, roll away the stone. There was a divine intervention. There was a resurrection from the dead. 
There was a transformation from death to life. There was a joyful ending. ending. Now, after Lazarus was resurrected, what did Jesus say to them? Loose him and let him go. Jesus didn't take the grave clothes off. They could do that. But they couldn't produce life. But they could obey God. And when they obeyed God, I'll tell you, it made the atmosphere conducive because of their obedient faith for God to intervene and do what they couldn't do. You've been waiting on God to do something? If you obey God in every area of your life. Do you need a miracle here or there or somewhere else? Is there corresponding works? Are you lining your life up with God so that God can honor your faith and your prayers and intervene and do what you can't do? But you've abandoned it to God so that God can do it. Answer that question, folk. Are we waiting on God this morning in disobedience and rebellion and partial obedience? Said, oh God, we want a divine intervention. We want revival in this town meeting. We want you to do the supernatural. Let me ask you the question. Are we repented up? God's commanded that of us. Have we confessed up? God commanded that of us. Are we prayed up? Are we obeying wherein that we know to obey? Have we made restitution where restitution needs to be made? Have we been reconciled to a brother that we need to be reconciled with? Have we confessed our sins and properly dealt with our sins? You say we wait on God to do something. God will do something, folk, whenever we have come in complete obedience to the commands of God. And done what God's calling on us to do. Now what we want to do is sit back and say, Oh God, we want to have a miracle. We want to see a miracle. We want you to do something. And God said, I'm just awaiting to do it. Oh, I'm so anxious to do it. Why don't you dig the ditches? Why don't you set out the oil pots? Why don't you roll away the stone? I'm just waiting to supply the water in a dry ground, send revival. I'm just waiting to fill the oil pots with the symbol of the Holy Ghost. I'm just waiting, I'll tell you, to have resurrected life in the church. I'm just waiting. Roll away the stones. Set out the oil pots. Dig the ditches. Make preparation for the blessings of God. We determine and we decide what kind of life we're going to live, whether it's going to be an open heaven of divine interventions and wonderful transformation and happy endings or whether or not it'll be the same old lifestyle of unbelief and disobedience. Never obeyed God in my life. I didn't expect God to do something. Never obeyed him unless he did do something. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Let that be your motto, Brother Ken.